On October 4, 2023, Pope Francis released Laudate Deum, an apostolic exhortation focused on the climate crisis. In the weeks leading up to its release, it became known as Laudato C 2.0. There are, of course, some similarities between the two documents. Laudato C, which was released in 2015, was an encyclical, almost 40,000 words in length, which focused on the climate crisis and other issues and Pope Francis's suggested solutions to these issues. Laudate Deum, in contrast, is an exhortation. It's much shorter in length, only about 7,500 words. In the next few minutes, we're going to look at the prophetic implications and these issues from a prophetic perspective. Let's look first at a outline of Laudate Deum. There were six chapters or sections in this document. The first one focused on the climate crisis. The second one uh, talked about the growing technocratic paradigm and Pope Francis's concern with the technology focus and the commerce focus that he sees in much of the world. In the, sec in the third section, uh, Pope Francis talked about the weakness of international politics and made a very strong call for a governing worldwide body or a collaboration of governing worldwide bodies that would hold nations accountable in the climate crisis. In the fourth section, Pope Francis talked about the climate conferences that have taken place up till this point, both their progress and their failures. In section five, he focused on the coming COP28 meetings in Dubai. And finally, in the last section, Pope Francis focused on the spiritual motivations that he hopes people will bring to the table to effect rapid action against climate change. Now, there was an interesting similarity between this document and the earlier one in 2015, and this observer remarked, I'll just be quoting from what they wrote. The most disappointing quality to Laudate Deum is that from paragraph number two through paragraph number 60, it could have been drafted by any intelligent non-believer working for a secular NGO. Jesus makes an appearance in paragraph number one, then goes on hiatus until paragraph number 64. In a text of 7,500 words, the word Jesus appears three times, God 11 times, church once, Catholic twice, biblical once, Bible once, and Christian once. Laudate Deum is an essentially secular document with a religious addendum. We're going to look briefly at several areas of this document that I believe are important for us to understand from a biblical and prophetic perspective. The first one is this. Pope Francis makes a very strong call for a global authority that has real power. In paragraph 35 he says, When we talk about the possibility of some form of world authority regulated by law, we need not necessarily think of a personal authority. We are speaking above all of more effective world organizations equipped with the power to provide for the global common good. So he's not thinking of an individual global president, rather an organization of some kind or perhaps organizations which are coordinated and work together. Now this of course is not a unique or original call that was made in Laudate Deum. In fact, popes for decades have been making similar pleas for a world authority that can handle many aspects of the world's laws and life. For example, Pope Paul VI wrote in 1967, who can fail to see the need and importance of thus gradually coming to the establishment of a world authority capable of taking effective action on the juridical and political planes. In 2003, Pope John Paul II said essentially the same thing. He said, is this not the time for all to work together for a new constitutional organization of the human family, truly capable of ensuring peace and harmony between peoples, as well as their integral development? And then Pope Benedict XVI wrote this, there is a strongly felt need for a reform of the United Nations organization, and likewise of economic institutions and internal finance, so that the concept of the family of nations can acquire real teeth. Now that last phrase, of course, was interesting. What did, Pope Fran or what did Pope Benedict XVI mean by real teeth? It uh, obviously means that this world authority has the power and the means of enforcing people or nations to follow the agenda that has been set forth. 
Another area of focus that was contained in Laudate Deum was found in paragraph 36, and that is that Pope Francis regrets that global crises are wasted for effecting change. He wrote, it continues to be regrettable that global crises are being squandered when they could be the occasions to bring about beneficial changes. This is what happened in the 2000 to 2008 financial crisis and again in the COVID-19 crisis. For the actual strategies developed worldwide in the wake of those crises fostered greater individualism, less integration and increased freedom for the truly powerful who always find a way to escape unscathed. I found this very interesting because most people I know would say that through COVID-19 and after COVID-19, there was less individual freedom than we had before, but apparently it's not enough or sufficient in Pope Francis's view. Another area of focus was found in paragraph 70, and that is that he calls for a personal and cultural spiritual transformation. This was near the end of the document, and Pope Francis wrote this. Yet what is most important is something less quantitative, the need to realize that there are no lasting changes without cult cultural changes, without a maturing of lifestyles and convictions within societies, and there are no cultural changes without personal changes. Now in this document, Pope Francis did not elaborate on what he believed those personal or cultural changes should be. However, he did in Laudato Si 1.0. In that document, he ended the document, the encyclical, by suggesting some very um, widespread changes that he would like to see take place both within families, within churches, and within society in general. And here's what he wrote. This was his solution to the climate problem. Paragraph 237 of Laudato Si. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, and with the world. So Pope Francis has suggested solution to the climate crisis as well as many of the other issues that he mentioned in that first document on the climate crisis is Sunday. A Sunday needs to be a day of rest and this will not only help people and families but also, so he says, the environment. Now, in the years following the release of Laudato Si, there was an action plan that was developed and then put into place uh, during COVID, the Vatican launches a seven-year Laudato Si action plan. The article stated, we will launch the Laudato Si action plan, which are seven jubilee years of concrete action. The hope is that it will create a massive movement of families, parishes, schools, and universities, health centers and hospitals, business and governments. So the plan here is that there would be a worldwide movement that takes seven years in order to put into place the suggested solutions contained in Laudato Si. And presumably that would also include the required Sunday rest, which is so important in Pope Francis's view to combating the climate crisis. The seven years would end with a special year of Jubilee. The article goes on to state, the reason for a seven year plan is based on the biblical significance of the number seven. Year one will be dedicated to planning through community building, resource sharing, and drafting local action plans. The next five years will be dedicated to concrete action, while the last year will be a sabbatical year dedicated to praise and thanking God. So Laudate Deum, released in 2023, is part of the concrete action plans designed to put into effect the Laudato Si action plan or the suggested solutions to the climate crisis contained in Laudato Si. There is a seven year time frame which the Vatican envisions with the last year, the seventh year, being a sabbatical year or a Sabbath year of rest. When was the action plan put in place? Well, this is an interesting article here from Earthbeat and it uh, points out that originally the Laudato Si action platform was to be a part of a special Laudato Si year celebrated throughout 2020 to mark the fifth anniversary of the encyclical. But the global COVID-19 outbreak delayed those plans and the year was marked from May 2020, five years after Francis completed the encyclical through May 2021. So even though the Laudato Si action platform was not announced and officially began until 2021, the original plan was that it would start in the year 2020. 
Now, why is this important? It's a seven-year plan ending in the year 2027. Pope Francis took office in the year 2013. So that would be 14 years after Pope Francis takes office that the Laudato Si agenda, including Sunday as a protected day of worship, is put into place. Now, what does this have to do with Bible prophecy? Again, we are looking at Laudate Deum, Laudato Si, and everything connected with this from a biblical prophetic perspective. At this point, let's turn to the Bible and take a look at what the Bible tells us. In Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, God explains why He alone is the Creator God. He said, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. One of the amazing things about God, who is the author of the Bible, is that Bible history repeats itself. And the stories and the events that happened far in the past have been repeated and will be repeated in the future. God makes it clear in this verse where He points out that the reason that He is God is that He can declare the end all the way from the beginning. In another Bible verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, we read, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So we're going to look at a Bible story that happened thousands of years ago that just may shed light on a 14-year time frame that we see taking place today. And that story is found in the book of Genesis with the story of Joseph and his time in Egypt. Reading from Genesis chapter 41 and beginning in verse 25, we read this, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kine, or cows, are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored cows, or kine, that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears, blasted with the east wind, shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he shows unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. So in the time of uh, the Egyptian dynasty's uh, prominence, Joseph, who was the grandson of Abraham, was taken captive by his jealous brothers. He was sold to Ishmaelite traders and became a slave in Egypt. Through a series of miraculous events, God took Joseph from a position of slavery to this passage where he is standing in front of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and Pharaoh has had these two dreams. No one else can explain or interpret the dreams, but Joseph, through God's help, is able to do that. We just read the interpretation of those dreams. And Joseph says, Pharaoh, there are seven years of plenty, and then there will be seven years following those first seven years, and the second set of seven years will be years of great famine, a 14-year time period. And at the end of that time period, Pharaoh, which we will see later in the story, ends up owning everything. He owns all of the land, he owns all of the people, he owns all of the money contained in Egypt, and by extension through the world, because at this time Egypt was the most powerful nation on earth. As the story develops, Joseph's brothers, who had actually sold him into slavery, end up coming to Egypt when their food runs out in Canaan. Joseph recognizes his brothers, but he doesn't immediately reveal himself. Instead, he puts them through a series of tests to see if their character has changed. And finally, at the end of those series of tests, Joseph is satisfied that his brothers have had a change in heart. He reveals himself, and they find that they have found their lost brother, whom they had told their father Jacob for years had been killed by a, a vicious beast in the wilderness. The point of the story is this. Joseph's brothers came to Egypt. They were looking for food or bread, but instead, or in addition to that food, they actually found their brother. Now here's where things get interesting. 
In a video several years ago, Pope Francis uh, referred to this story about Joseph and his brothers in Egypt, and he called himself or referred to himself as the long-lost brother that his brothers needed to rediscover in a time of crisis. Here's the short video clip. Io la nostalgia che questa separazione finisca e ci dia la comunione. Io la nostalgia di quell'abbraccio di qua nel quale parla la Sacra Scrittura, quando i fratelli di Giuseppe affamati sono andati a Egitto per comprare, per poter mangiare, ma andavano a comprare, avevano i soldi, ma non potevano mangiare i soldi. E lì hanno trovato qualcosa più del pasto, hanno trovato il fratello. So just to make sure that we don't miss the point that Pope Francis is trying to make, the man who was filming this video, his name was Tony Palmer, he recorded another video where he explains exactly the message that Pope Francis is trying to give by calling himself the long-lost brother. Here's that video. Pope Francis himself is the one who is asking us for full unity and full communion. What is striking is that he awakens us to the fact that the real communion is not the bread, but the brother. When he uses his story about the brothers of Joseph with, because of their hunger, starvation in fact, they were then propelled to Egypt to go find bread to eat. But they found something more than bread. They found their brother. And this, Pope Francis, is saying this is what we find in the true communion. We find each other. We find our brotherhood. We find our brother and our sister that we thought we'd lost. When we look for bread, which we think we need, we are going to find our brother, with, which is what we really need. We need to find that we are brothers and sisters again. So don't miss the message in these two videos. The message is that the true communion is not in the bread, but in the brother. And if we can come together and unite once again, as Christians or even as all faiths in this world, perhaps around some crisis, we will have the true communion and humanity can move forward. The message is that the bread does not matter at all. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, what does bread represent in the Bible? And there are some Bible verses that tell us exactly what bread represents. The first one is found here in John 6 verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. According to Jesus, he himself is the bread of life. And then there is a second meaning for what bread represents in the Bible, and that's found in Matthew 4, verse 4. That verse says, But he answered and said, this is Jesus speaking, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So according to the Bible, bread represents Jesus Christ himself, and it also represents the Bible, the Word of God. And these two uh, meanings of bread are extremely important for us to recognize today and in terms of what we are studying here. Remember that Pope Francis said that the bread does not matter, what really matters is the brother. If we can unite together, that's where the true answer is found. The answer is not found in the bread. Now let's look at a few more Bible verses. In Hebrews 9 verse 14, we read this, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 
One of the things that Jesus Christ does as uh, our Savior and our High Priest in heaven is to cleanse our conscience from dead works to living works. In other words, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, when we ask for Him to begin changing us and making us like Him, He promises through the power of His blood and the power of His life and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform how we think and how we speak and how we act. This verse in Hebrews 9.14 refers to this transformation as God purging our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And don't miss this point that according to the Bible, only one person has the right to purge or control your conscience, and that is the person who died for you. It is Jesus Christ through the power of His blood. That sacrifice gave Him the right to control your conscience if you give Him the right to. He will never do it by force, but if you ask Him to, He will take control and He will purge our thoughts. Now, practically speaking, how does God do that? How does Jesus accomplish this? And the answer is found in another verse from Hebrews, and that's Hebrews 10, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. How does Jesus purge our conscience? He does it through taking the principles of His Word, and especially the principles of His law, the Ten Commandments, and He writes them on our minds and our hearts. And as He does this through the Holy Spirit, we become changed and transformed. These two things, Jesus Christ, His blood, uh, what He does in our lives, and the Word of God, and especially the law of God, these two things constitute the bread. And we are being told, supposedly, that the bread does not matter. What matters is the brother. What matters is unity together, visible unity. A Catholic website called CatholicAnswers.com had this very interesting definition of the word fundamentalism. The belief that is first and foremost the defining characteristic of fundamentalists is their reliance on the Bible to the complete exclusion of any authority exercised by the church. The second is their insistence on a faith in Christ as one's personal Savior and Lord. And this was an official statement. You can see at the top of the screen that this statement and the website and the article all uh, contained the imprimatur. This is the stamp of approval from the Bishop of San Diego. So what is this statement saying? This statement is saying that in the Roman Catholic viewpoint, if you exercise faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you are a fundamentalist. If you believe that the Bible contains the answers for your life, if you believe that the Bible is the ultimate authority, in God's communication to man, then you are a fundamentalist. What is important for us to recognize is that these two things, Jesus Christ Himself and faith in Him, and secondly, the Word of God, these are the two definitions of bread that the Bible contains. And once again, Pope Francis made it very clear that we are not to seek after the bread. When we think we need bread, what we actually need is our brother. And he's referring to himself when he says that. Tony Palmer made that very clear. Now, Pope Francis gave a strong call to the United States Congress in 2015 when he spoke there, and he said, we must be especially attentive to every type of fundamentalism, whether religious or of any other kind. And so here is perhaps a shielded warning against the bread, right? Against those that would place their faith in Jesus Christ as a personal Savior and Lord, and those who accept the Bible and regard the Bible as the ultimate authority. Another fascinating and interesting statement put forth by the Holy See is contained in this document. This is titled, The Church at the United Nations, and we read, As a full member of the international community, the Holy See finds itself in a very peculiar situation because it is spiritual in nature. Its authority is religious and not political. The real and only realm of the Holy See is the realm of conscience. And friends, it is for this reason that the Protestant reformers for centuries understood and regarded this entity, the Roman Catholic Church, as the Babylon of the Apocalypse. To the reformers, Rome was the Babylon of the Apocalypse, and the papal pontiff the predicted man of sin. 
separation from the Church of Rome and from its pontifical head was regarded by them as a sacred duty. To them, separation from Rome was not separation from Christ, but from Antichrist. This was the principle upon which they began and prosecuted the work of the Reformation, the principle which directed and supported them and rendered them invincible. The Reformers were not completely united on every point of doctrine, but on this point they were very clear and they were united that this system which had taken control of Christianity and control of Europe for over a thousand years had fallen away from Bible truth and actually become the Babylon of the Apocalypse. Now this view, this understanding, was not shared just by the Protestant Reformers. The founders of the United States of America also understood the danger that this uh, religious and political system posed to the type of government that they were trying to set up. John Adams wrote in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, I have long been decided in opinion that a free government and the Roman Catholic religion can never exist together in any nation or country. Liberty and popery cannot live together. Those were strong words from John Adams, but he was not alone in this opinion. Abraham Lincoln once said, I do not pretend to be a prophet, but though not a prophet, I see a very dark cloud on our horizon. And that dark cloud is coming from Rome. It is filled with tears of blood. It will rise and increase till its flanks will be torn by a flash of lightning, followed by a fearful peal of thunder. Then a cyclone such as the world has never seen will pass over this country, spreading ruin and desolation from north to south. Neither I nor you, but our children, will see those things. Another person active during the founding years of the United States was the French general Marquis de Lafayette. He wrote, It is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. They have instigated most of the wars in Europe. Now, as the papacy looked at the type of government that was being set up in the United States, they expressed their concern as well with the freedom of conscience and the separation of church and state that was being formed in the United States. In 1864, Pope Pius IX condemned that erroneous opinion, most fatal in its effects on the Catholic Church and the salvation of souls, that liberty of conscience and worship is each man's personal right, which ought to be legally proclaimed and asserted in every rightly constituted society and that a right resides in the citizens to an absolute liberty, which should be restrained by no authority, whether ecclesiastical or civil, whereby they may be able openly and publicly to manifest and declare any of their ideas whatever, either by word of mouth, by the press, or in any other way. In other words, every freedom guaranteed in the First Amendment, in the Bill of Rights, Pope Pius IX did not agree with. He was very concerned that it would destroy the agenda and the power that the Catholic Church had exercised for over a thousand years in Europe. What about the papacy today? Thomas Doyle is a Catholic priest and he served for a number, number of years as a canon lawyer in the Vatican uh, Embassy in Washington, D.C. He said several years ago on an interview with NPR, the Holy See is the last absolute monarchy in the world today. The Pope, when he is elected, is answerable to no human power. He has absolute authority over the entire Roman Catholic Church, direct authority that reaches down to individual members. And how close does that authority come? We already saw in a previous statement that the Vatican, the Holy See, the Papacy, and the Pope claim to have direct authority all the way down to a person's conscience. Thomas Doyle goes on, In the Roman Catholic Church, the office of Pope includes the three main offices of government. He is the supreme judge, the supreme legislator, and the supreme executive. So there's no separation of powers. There is no possibility of checks and balances. What we see in the form of government that defines the papacy is a union of church and state and a hierarchical form of government which goes all the way from the Pope down to individual members and includes his right to control, coerce, and compel the conscience. The Protestant reformers looked at this system in their time and they identified this system with prophetic figures found in the book of Revelation. One of those is the beast found in Revelation chapter 13. 
That passage begins in verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. We are reminded at this point of Joseph's story in Egypt. He was a slave. He was a nobody. But he was given power and authority by Pharaoh, who was the true power in Egypt. We read here in Revelation 13, verse 2, that the beast, which the Protestant reformers identified with the papal system, it does not receive its power because it in itself is powerful. Rather, it receives its power from another source, and that source is the dragon. Verse 3 goes on, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. According to Bible prophecy, this power, the papal power, would receive what appears to be a deadly wound. This happened in 1798, when Napoleon's army marched into Rome, took the pope captive, and took him back in exile to France, where he died a year later. This effectively destroyed the political influence and power that the papacy had exercised in varying degrees for over a thousand years. And from that point forward in 1798, the Roman Catholic Church's uh, temporal and political power continued to decline through the 1800s until in the 1870s it lost the papal states. Those were the lands surrounding uh, what today is the Vatican City. And it reached a low point in the late 1800s. But the Bible says in Revelation 13 verse 3 that this deadly wound would be healed and at that point all the world would eventually wander after the beast. In 1929 the Lateran Treaty recognized the Vatican as a legal entity, as a political power. The Vatican State was formed at that point and since then, just as the prophecy predicts, the papacy has again been regaining an influence and power throughout the world. Now let's go back to Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 47. What happens at the end of this story? After the 14 years have passed, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, at the end of this 14 years, Pharaoh is now in control of everything in Egypt. Let's read about it, Genesis 47 beginning in verse 13. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So in the famine in Egypt, all of the money is eventually spent to buy food, and the people now have no more money. Pharaoh has all of the money to be found in the land of Egypt. What else happens? And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money fails. And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give for your cattle if money fail. So after Pharaoh took control of all of the money in Egypt, then the people sold him their cattle, and we would presume their other personal possessions. And so all of the private property now belongs to Pharaoh as well. What happened next? And they brought their cattle unto Joseph. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, and for the flocks, and for the cattle of the herds, and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year, and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies in our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed, that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. So not only did Pharaoh end up owning all of the money in Egypt, but he owned all of the personal property, and now the people have sold their land and even themselves to Pharaoh. Pharaoh owns everything in the land of Egypt. Verse 20 goes on, And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. 
we're reminded of a statement made not long ago by the WEF, the World Economic Forum, which projected by the, that by the year 2030, uh, nobody would own private property anymore. You would have no possessions of your own. Rather, you would rent everything, and in addition, they said, you would be happy about it. It's interesting that the Egyptians, while they were certainly sorry to lose their possessions and their land, they were happy that they could at least survive. And so, in some sense, they were glad to hand over everything that they owned to Pharaoh in exchange for life itself. Genesis 47 continues in verse 21. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Are we seeing a push in our world today to bring everybody into cities, to bring people out of the country and to place them into cities? We are, and we have even seen talk about these 15-minute cities where you won't even have to own a vehicle. Everything will be within walking distance. You can walk and get everything you need within 15 minutes. Pharaoh will provide everything if you will give up your freedoms and move to the small or the large city. Verse 22 goes on, Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. So in ancient Egypt, at the end of the 14 years, Pharaoh owned absolutely everything to be found in the land of Egypt, and he owned all the land itself except for the land that had been given to the priests. So there was a certain religion, right? The official religion of Egypt, which was favored. And Pharaoh didn't touch them. He didn't touch the priests. In many ways, they were the real power in Egypt. And Pharaoh realized that he couldn't take their lands. He better let them remain in power. Could a possible situation arise at the end of time here? Bible prophecy says it will, that the beast will uh, regain its strength, that the world will wonder after the beast, and that the nations of earth will follow in line and serve the beast's agenda. Genesis 47 verse 23 goes on, Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase, that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. So what Egypt ended up with at the end of the 14 years was really a serfdom, which was the same structure, societal structure, that existed in the Middle Ages when the papacy was in power in Europe. The, the crown owned everything, or the church owned everything, and by extension the crown then owned everything by permission of the church. Next in line were the wealthy landlords and the um, aristocracy. Uh, and finally, you had the people and the, the peasants, which worked the land. They owned nothing, but they were given what they needed to simply survive in return for the protection and the giving of food and so forth by the king. Where does this bring us now? What about the Laudato Si sabbatical year in 2027? We have seen a similarity between the 14 years in Joseph's time, which brought Egypt through seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine, and ended at the end of that 14-year time period with Pharaoh owning absolutely everything in the land of Egypt. Could there be a parallel with what is happening right now? Again, there is a 14-year time span between 2013, when Pope Francis took office, and the year 2027, when he hopes that the Laudato Si action platform will have been put fully into effect. We've already seen that the year 2027 is projected to be the sabbatical year of Jubilee, when the work is finished. That reminds us of God's work of creation, doesn't it? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2 that on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all His work which God created and made. According to the Bible, God spent six days uh, building and uh, creating this earth, and then He rested on the seventh day. That seventh day was a celebration, a, a Sabbath to memorialize God's finished and completed work of creation. 
The Laudato C action platform projects a, an entire year in 2027 of Sabbath rest and celebration because a work of recreating, or maybe we could say resetting the world, has been completed. Genesis 20 verses 8 through 11 say this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, now thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Friends, the Bible tells us very clearly that the seventh day, which is still Saturday today, that is the day that God has blessed and made holy because it is the day that He rested on at the end of creation. That seventh day Sabbath was not made just for the Jews. Creation happened long, long before there was any Jews here on earth. And when Jesus came to earth, He said in Mark 2 verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man. He didn't say the Sabbath was made just for the Jews or just for the Armenians or just for the Russians or for any group of people. Instead, he said the Sabbath was made for humanity, and God made that clear by resting on the seventh day of creation. In the Ten Commandments, we find a reminder of that seventh day Sabbath. This is why that commandment begins with the word remember. God knew that we as humans would have a, a way of forgetting this commandment above all of the others. Why should we worship and remember God on this day, the seventh day of each week? The answer is given in Genesis 20 verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and He rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The fourth commandment, the one about the seventh day Sabbath, is the only commandment in the entire Bible that tells us when to worship God and why to worship God. Why do we worship Him? Because He is our Creator. When do we worship Him? On the seventh day of each week. Now in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, there is a strong warning from God about something called the mark of the beast. It has to do with worship. It's connected with worshiping God as Creator. Here's what that verse says, Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, a dire warning is given after this. You do not want to receive the mark of the beast, friends. But the Bible is clear. The mark of the beast involves the issue of worship. How do we worship God? By observing His seventh day Sabbath. Why do we worship God? Because He is the Creator. He is the one that created this world, that set it into motion and continues to provide for all forms of life here on earth. In Revelation 15 verse 2, a promise is given that it will be possible to avoid the mark of the beast. Here's what the verse says. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Notice the four words in yellow on your screen. There are four things that God promises victory over if we put our faith in Jesus Christ and if we trust in the Bible. Those things are the beast, his image, his mark, and the name or the number of the beast. Let's look at these closely because we will see that these four things, the beast, the image, the mark, and the number of his name, these four things represent attacks or counterfeits against the first four Ten Commandments. Revelation 15 verse 2 promises that God can give people victory over the beast. The book of Revelation is very clear that the beast wants worship. We've looked at some of those verses. Revelation 13 verse 3 says that all the world will wonder after or worship the beast. This is an attack against the first of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 verse 3, the first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There is a power on earth that wants to take the place of God and wants to receive the worship that is due only to God. The second thing that God promises victory over is the image of the beast. Revelation warns us about the image of the beast in Revelation chapter 13. It says that the image of the beast will speak and cause that as many as would not worship the beast should receive the mark of the beast. And then there's a death penalty that eventually is attached. Well, the second commandment, friends, talks to us about having no graven images. Exodus 20 verse 4 says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. 
So the image of the beast in Revelation is an attack against or a counterfeit of the second commandment. What about the name of the beast? The third commandment says in Exodus 20 verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. In the book of Revelation, a person's name often represents their character. When we read about the different names of God or the different names of Jesus Christ, those different names communicate or represent different aspects of God's character or of Jesus' character. When we read in Revelation 15 verse 2 that God promises to give victory over the mark of the beast, He also says that He will give people victory over the number of His name. The name of the beast represents a power that might be claiming to serve or worship God, but in actuality has fallen away from Bible truth and is not serving God at all. Professing to be one who serves God and yet who is actively working against God's agenda is a hypocrite, and that would be in violation of the third commandment. See, the third commandment says in Exodus 20 verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Yes, this means that we shouldn't use God's name in those expletives, but it also means that we should not claim to serve God and at the same time actually be not serving Him or even fighting against what God is trying to do. Now I have a question for you. If the beast is an attack against commandment number one, and the image of the beast is an attack against commandment number two, and the name of the beast is an attack against commandment number three, then logic tells us that the mark of the beast must involve an attack against the fourth commandment. Again, the fourth commandment reads, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The fourth commandment tells us which day to worship God on. It's the seventh day of the week. And yet, the power in the world today, the last absolute monarch in the world today, is telling us that they want to protect another day, and it's not the seventh day that God has set up. It is the first day of the week, or Sunday. This is not the first time in history that the Roman Catholic Church has pushed for a legal protection of Sunday. The Emperor Constantine did it 17 centuries ago. And here is how one historian explains what happened. Constantine did many things to favor the bishops. He made decisions and disputed cases final as the decision of Christ. But in nothing that he did for them did he give them power over those who did not belong to the church to compel them to act as though they did, except in the one thing of the Sunday law. In the Sunday law, power was given to the church to compel those who did not belong to the church and who were not subject to the jurisdiction of the church to obey the commands of the church. In the Sunday law, there was given to the church control of the civil power so that by it she could compel those who did not belong to the church to act as though they did. The history of Constantine's time may be searched through and through, and it will be found that in nothing did he give to the church any such power except in this one thing, the Sunday law. Now, friends, the Bible tells us that history will repeat itself. And what happened in the past with Constantine's Sunday law will happen once again, the book of Revelation tells us. When laws are put in place to compel people's conscience to worship on a day that God has not sanctioned or ordained. This was the whole concern that the founders of the United States had as they looked across the ocean and saw how the papacy had governed Europe for over a thousand years. They consciously made the decision, we will establish a form of government that separates church and state so that the conscience cannot be compelled. We have also seen that Pope Pius IX in the 1860s also realized that the form of government in the United States, this separation of church and state, the, the freedom of, of conscience and religion, did not fit with the papal form of government. And so he wrote very strongly against the freedoms that have made this nation what it is uh, for over 250 years. So where are we headed? Is it possible that we will again someday have laws compelling men to worship or act as though they were servants of the church, even though they're not? Will there again at some point be laws mandating people to worship on the first day of the week? Will there be laws that give the church control of the civil power? Here's what Pope John Paul II wrote in 1998. He said, Therefore, also in the particular circumstances of our own time, 
Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. Many people will ask, is the civil protection of Sunday worship really a big deal? After all, almost all Christians already worship on Sunday. Wouldn't we just be recognizing what Christians have been doing for centuries? I'll let the Catholic Church answer that question in their own published writings. The Church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. Deny the authority of the Church, and you have no adequate or reasonable explanation or justification for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday. Another published writing says this, The Catholic Church designated Sunday as the day for corporate worship and gets full credit or blame for the change. By worshiping on the seventh day of the week, people recognize God's authority as Creator. By worshiping on the first day of the week, or by keeping that day holy, sacred, or set apart, people recognize not God's authority, but the authority of men. The Bible says that all the world will wonder after the beast, that it will get on the papacy's agenda, that it will come on board with the Laudato Si action platform, and that that uh, agenda will reach its completion and fulfillment. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us an exact year, but we have been given a proposed and hoped for time frame by Pope Francis. He wants it to happen by the year 2027, which would be 14 years after he came to power. A final thing that Pope Francis writes about in Laudate Deum, and that is a call for global citizens to pressure political changes. He writes in paragraph 38, the demands that rise up from below throughout the world, where activists from very different countries help and support one another, can end up pressuring the sources of power. It is to be hoped that this will happen with respect to the climate crisis. For this reason, I reiterate that unless citizens control political power, national, regional, and municipal, it will not be possible to control damage to the environment. So Pope Francis is calling for a groundswell movement in every nation of earth where ordinary citizens will pressure their local governments, their regional governments, their national governments to put in place the suggested solution to the climate crisis, which we saw in the Laudato Si very clearly. Sunday is Pope Francis' solution to the Sunday crisis as well as a number of other issues that he identifies in the world today. Friends, the Bible tells us in Revelation 13, verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The hymn in this verse is the beast power. And to worship not only means to bow down on your knee and worship in that form of worship, it also means to serve or to obey. And the Bible predicts that all the world will eventually, and for a short time, get on board with this agenda that there will be a groundswell of, 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 of um, activism that pressures governments at all levels to put into place the beast's agenda. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. You can have your name written in the Lamb's book of life by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Jesus said, I am the bread. And when we accept Jesus as the bread of life, he promises to forgive us of our sins and to begin the work of transformation in our lives as he writes the principles of God's law on our minds and our hearts. We take the Bible, we look at it, and that is the word, and those are the principles that God wants to write on our minds and our hearts. Friends, we need the bread. Communion is important, the brothers are important, but the bread is absolutely essential. We cannot set the bread aside. We cannot set Jesus aside. We cannot set aside the Word of God for a visible unity because that visible unity will only last a very short time. And when Jesus comes back in the clouds of glory, that visible unity will shatter apart. Revelation predicts that Babylon will fall and shatter into thousands of pieces and Jesus Christ will then set up His kingdom forever and ever. How can you be part of Christ's kingdom? Here's what the Bible says in Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friends, don't miss it. 
God is telling you how you can stand firm, how you can avoid the mark of the beast, how you cannot be deceived at the end of time. How do you do that? By placing your faith in Jesus Christ and by keeping the commandments of God. By valuing the bread, even as you love the brother, but keeping that bread of Jesus and the word of God as most important in your life. Let's pray right now. Father in heaven, I pray for every person that will watch or listen to this, that they will make that decision if they never have before, to accept you as their personal savior, to value the principles contained in the word of God and with your help to live out what we read in the Bible. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Friend, would you like to worship God on his holy day, the seventh day Sabbath? This is the day that God set apart as holy and sacred at the end of creation week. It's the day that Jesus worshiped on when he was here on earth. If you would like to worship God with others on this holy day, I invite you to contact Pathway to Paradise Ministries by following the link to our website in the description of this video. We will reply to you after you fill out our contact page and we will connect you with a local Seventh-day Sabbath keeping church. God loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die for you. He is doing everything that he can so that you can spend eternity with him. All he needs is your yes and your invitation to work in his life. Won't you give that to him today?